Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for coming to Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be metastatic uh, carcinoma to the spine. And uh, I'm going to show two real cases uh, of mine. So this is the first case, 74-year-old woman uh, who came to my office with mid mid-thoracic back pain. And um, uh, she came to me in 2014. And she, um, she never goes to the doctor. Uh, she had her gallbladder out once. She went to the ER, had that out. Uh, and she doesn't believe in doctors because uh, doctors are very expensive and uh, she doesn't want any surgery or any treatment. She feels fine. So um, no medical problems other than the gallbladder out. So what do you think, uh, Brad, what do you think of the x-ray here? What do you see? So she's got a dish, a lot of degeneration through the mid-thoracic spine. Uh, it's like she might have a compression deformity right at the apex there. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to see too because of the dish osteoporosis, and she's got a little bit of scoliosis, right? right? So it's it's hard to it's hard to see. So you see this patient in your office. I mean, obviously she has metastatic breast cancer, right. but if you didn't know that, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, you would think it's just dish, right? right. It's a dish. So I gave her. Um, it's very wide dish because there are some people that don't understand. Yeah. Okay, that. dish. I'm sorry. So dish is this is dish diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Uh, it's basically bridging syndesmophytes across the spine. It's very common, more common uh, in men than in women as they get older. And like an 80-year-old man, it's like, I think it's like 60% of men have this. It's very common. And uh, the whole spine, it can fuse, and it can be painful too. It's a spondyloarthropathy. So everybody knows, is that good? Everybody know what dish is? Diffuse endopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Um, so, I mean, I just gave her steroids, uh, uh, pain pills. I said, well, it's going to get better. Uh, but it didn't get better. And then she went to her primary care physician two months later and she said, now my rib hurts. And they got this x-ray and um, Derek, show everybody the findings. Derek's, uh, he's really good at radiology. So it's so it's quite, she had a destructive lesion. So all of a sudden it's like different different ball game here. And I was like, oh no, Let, let's, um, I didn't, I just admitted her to the hospital and she had a workup uh, and the MRI, here's the MRI and the CAT scan. And um, how about Ray, tell everybody, tell everybody what you see uh, here, here, Ray. So, um, so we're looking at sagittal uh, thoracic uh, CT scans. And you can see uh, in the posterior aspect that I'm assuming that's probably, uh, I don't know, mid thoracic spine, T7, T8. Yeah. Um, there's some uh, soft tissue density within the bone. So there's probably lytic lesions or some kind of soft tissue mass posteriorly uh, at two levels. And it looks like it kind of goes into the canal a little bit. So. Yeah. Well, here's the axial cut. The axial cut. See the bottom left one? Uh -huh. A little bit in the canal. Someone right. up against the spinal cord. Yeah. So, and she also had lesions. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Ray? You good? Um, I mean, it's exophytic, so you know, it, it seems like unless there's like a listhesis, so it looks like it's kind of coming out of the out of uh, yeah, out of the vertebral body. So she uh, she also had a uh, uh, five centimeter uh, breast mass, which she did a needle biopsy in mm -hmm. the breast. Turned out it was breast carcinoma, stage mm -hmm. four. <clears throat> And it was in the uh, acetabulum, spine, proximal fever. Her pain was not severe. She was neurologically intact. And um, she didn't want surgery. No way. So, um, and I felt she didn't have much of a deformity. Uh, the spinal cord compression was, I thought, mild, neurologically intact. She was walking around. So she treated radiation and chemo. And um, uh, just to... Uh, just go over it. There's a way to grade epidural uh, spinal cord compression, and depending on if it's into the spinal canal, compressing the spinal cord, deforming the spinal cord, and the last one is there's no CSF left. So um, you can grade it if you want. So this patient, I followed her for um, two years until she died. And um, she basically, she didn't die from this problem. She just kind of uh, just... Uh, became cachexic and uh, she didn't want chemo anymore, but her spine lasted. She had no problems with her back. So this was a non-operative case. So I just wanted to, any questions about that case? 
So the, the goal, the basically thing is if you, if you can kill the cancer with radiation and chemo, the bone becomes normal. It like heals in, it fills in, and the patients are fine. And that's what happened with her. You know if you did subsequent MRIs on her when you called her? No, I didn't do an MRI. She had no symptoms. And um, she occasionally came back. She said her legs were weak a little bit. And I was like, how weak? Like, do you want me to get another MRI? She goes, no, nah, they're not that bad. And um, so it was a non-issue. She, she was ambulatory and basically pain-free until she died. Yeah, which is important. Okay, so um, any questions about that case? All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go quickly. Interrupt me. I'm gonna go quickly. Interrupt me if you have any questions or comments. So, cancer. Of course, everything that's important in this world is Greek. Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> right? It's true. And cancer in in ancient Greek, karkinos is cancer, and Hippocrates named cancer. Uh, Karkinos. Why he called it cancer, a crab, nobody knows. Maybe it was hard, maybe it was painful, like a crab biting you. Um, but uh, that's not the ancient, the, the modern Greek word is uh, kavuras, ancient Greek is karkinos. And uh, all this Cornelius Celsus, he was a Roman um, medical writer, encyclopedist. He, he called it cancer in Latin, which is, um, which is the same word for crab. And uh, he's really the one who called it cancer. And he wrote um, this treatise in um, was it 50 AD. Um, and at the time, it was the biggest uh, medical textbook in the world. And it was found by uh, Pope Nicholas V in the 1300s. And he, he was one of the first books that was made in the printing press. And um, you can find this book online. Actually, I read through it. There's a whole orthopedic section. And it goes over all the bone injuries, like depressed skull fracture, what to do with it open fractures, clavicle fractures, spine fractures, everything in detail. I mean, it's interesting. This is like, this is from Hippocrates from 400 BC. So, you know, he had, he had a whole like 50 pages of uh, what to do with these injuries. And it's interesting. I mean, after a while it gets boring. But, so um, the lifetime risk of getting cancer is a third for everybody, which is high. And the top cancer is breast cancer. And the, the cancers that metastasize, they usually go to the bones, liver, or lungs, the, the metastatic lesions. And the cancer has to, the cells have to leave the cancer lesion, has to go into a blood vessel, has to enter the blood vessel, has to leave the blood vessel, has to go into a bone, and has to grow in the bone. All those things have to happen. And the most common metastatic lesions are uh, breast, prostate, lung, renal, hematopoietic tumors, and thyroid. And this shows you where they go, what bones. The most common are the spine, the proximal femur and the pelvis. Um, I, won't, I won't go into that. Uh, more common in the thoracic spine than the lumbar spine. I'm not sure, but I think I think there's just more bone in the thoracic spine than the lumbar. So it's just probability of where is it going to go. Um, and the most common bone cancer is breast cancer. So when you get a met of uh, unknown origin, this this uh, study from I remember this came out in 1993 during my residency is one of the best studies ever done ever I think where they they followed people with skeletal metastases of unknown origin and the workup and basically the workup is uh, uh, physical exam hold on physical exam chest x-ray cat scan chest abdomen pelvis bone scan and blood work and if you do all that you can find the primary 85 percent of the time uh, and um, the imaging studies are x-rays bone scans cat scan we just went over that and uh, the bone scan is good because it tells you the, uh, what bones are involved and the diffuseness of the tumor. The CAT scan is better for seeing the destruction of the bone, in cortical detail. And the, the benefits of getting this big workup is you can rule out just the primary uh, sarcoma of bone, which is a different animal. Very rare, but it can happen. Uh, you can find an easier thing to biopsy, like maybe it's something's easier than the spine. Um, if it's renal cell, you probably want to embolize it. So you should know going into the case that it's renal cell. Um, that's what I think, and I usually try to embolize it or I send it to university. Uh, you can avoid a biopsy, and also you tell the pathologist what you think it may be. And just the lab work, the SPEP, prostate, uh, calcium, always check the calcium. So any questions about uh, can metastatic cancer so far, the workup? Okay, so let's, let's just talk about breasts. Um, in the, in the, the breasts are, you know, it's an unusual organ. It's made... 
they're made to make milk. And then after the, the woman is done childbirth, you don't need it anymore. And But the problem is these same anatomical structures can cause cancer as the woman gets older. And you can see the number two is the lobules, the little breast lobules, and then the ducts. And those are the two areas where you can get cancer, either the ducts or the lobules. And you can see the, the, the lobules and then the two ducts, and you have all these tiny ducts. And most women, I think, get uh, mammograms once a year. And you can get on the left is a very fatty breast, and on the right is a very dense breast. And it makes a big difference uh, for the mammogram because if the breast is dense from all the lobules from the milk, uh, you can't see the cancer. So those women, they have a hard time. They have to get frequent mammograms. They have to get ultrasounds. And, uh, and the reason is because of the density of the lobules. So I, I didn't know all this until I did this conference. It's interesting. Uh, and on the left, you see a duct. Uh, and on the right is the intraductal carcinoma. And 80% of breast cancer is ductal. Um, which is the most common. And it's stage four cancer is when the cancer has spread beyond the breast into other parts of the body. And breast cancer is uh, characterized molecularly. And uh, the worst, the, the most aggressive is a triple negative. And uh, this is beyond my understanding, uh, but they, they check the e, uh, estrogen receptors, the progesterone receptors, HER2 uh, molecular. Thing. And, and all this is very important in the chemotherapy and the treatment. So any questions? About breast cancer? That was quick. All right, we'll keep going. So this is case two. This is a 73-year-old woman, same age, with thoracic pain. And uh, she had three months of pain, mid-thoracic at the bra line, radiation to the ribs, no lower extremity pain, no injury. It, she, she could barely winch, uh, walk. Every time she sneezed, uh, she had pain. She's relatively healthy. She has AFib. She's on a, a blood thinner for that. And here are x-rays. So I'll, I'll go back to Brad again because he did the first one. It looks pretty similar, doesn't it? Same case. So, yeah, same age, a little bit of scoliosis, same thing. A lot of arthritis, osteoporosis, you don't really see much. So I gave her a steroid pack, pain meds, muscle relaxers, center of physical therapy. And um, I said, see you back in a couple weeks. Did you do anything different? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so... Three, uh, two weeks later, my secretary calls me. He's like, this patient you saw, do you remember her? I was like, not really. Uh, you know, I see so many people. I was like, well, she went to the ER. She, she, can't, she can't walk. She's 10 out of 10 pain. She takes oxycodone. She can't do anything. I was like, okay, just, just get an MRI. So my thoughts is she probably has a compression fracture. Let's see what's going on. So I sent her for an MRI right away. So here's the MRI. So uh, what are your thoughts uh, here? Who else? Zane, what do you think of the MRI? You're a smart guy. Um, so there's definitely a infiltrated lesion in the bone. Yeah, T8, T9, T10. Yeah. Uh, definitely cord compression. Yeah. Nine at the apex. Yeah, you can see the spinal cord's compressed there, right? Yeah, those three elements are involved. Yeah. So doing a workup in somebody like this is very difficult as an outpatient. I usually just admit them. Do you guys do anything different? I usually just admit them. It's just too stressful for the patient. You get everything, get the biopsy. So I admitted the patient, and she could barely walk, but I'm not sure if it was from pain or if it was from the uh, spinal cord compression. It was difficult to, uh, to evaluate. And you see the axial cuts at T8. There's some room for the spinal cord, but you see at T9, the, the, the front of the body is involved, the pedicles are involved. All around the spinal cord, it's involved, and you can't really see much in the way of CSF. And these are T2 images. These are uh, these are uh, fat uh, T1 um, T1 with dye. Um, you can I mean you can see the CSF there, right? You see the black. You see the the spinal cord is a circle in the middle, and then the black stuff is the CSF. So. T10, and here's uh, the CAT scan. She had 30 degrees of kyphosis from T7 to T9. And um, I, I admitted her, I, I, and then I, I, um, I have a policy. I always call oncology, and I call radiation oncology, and I say there's a patient here that needs treatment, and I would like you all to see her. Do you guys do anything different? That's what I do. I get them on board right away. Do you guys do anything different? I do the same thing. I get Onc on board, and... You know, they're helping out right from the get-go, putting yeah. their input. 
Yeah, tell them what to think. And, and, and they're smart, and, and it's good that we all talk constantly. So she, her, her brain uh, was uh, clean. And um, I just did a little reading about brain metastatic uh, lesions in newly diagnosed breast cancer. Uh, this is a, a JAMA oncology article from 2017. And um, the worst prognosis were triple negative breast cancer patients if they had brain mets. The sur median survival for a breast carcinoma stage four with brain mets was 10 months. The range was six months. Six months was for the triple negatives, and the 21 months uh, was for the uh, uh, HER positives, PR positives, everything's positives. So, um, you have anything to add to that, Ray? Does that sound about right? Um, you know, if there's like one to three of a study that came out, basically one to three mets, surgical interventions. Brain? Three, brain mets, yeah. So she was in the hospital, so we decided we had time. She was, we decided to do a, a she had a large five centimeter breast mass, and um, I didn't I didn't diagnose it because uh, quite frankly I don't examine women's breasts in the office. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, the oncologist did, and um, this was a very big breast mass. So obviously uh, in this case. Uh, there's a certain amount of denial, which which I think is very, very, very common. And they, they have a serious problem and they deny it. Uh, and uh, so they did a biopsy, which showed, uh, this is the biopsy, fine needle biopsy, which showed uh, the um, uh, ductal carcinoma. You can see those little lobules in there. You see it's like a needle and you see the little circles. Everybody see that? It's consistent with uh, ductal uh, breast carcinoma. So... So any questions so far? So you got a patient? You have any comments or questions? You have a patient, spinal cord compression, 30 degree kyphotic deformity, cancer involving three bones at the apex of thoracic spine. Uh, she can't walk. Oxycodones aren't working. Personally, I felt this was a surgical case, um, even though it's a stage four. Does, they, does anybody have any, uh, you can disagree with it. Anybody disagree? Yeah, I mean, you know, the indications for surgery for, for mats, that's one of the indications for surgery for mats, not ambulatory or weak mats. So, you know, do surgery first and then radiate. Most of the other ones you radiate first and then you then consider surgery if you need to. Another reason why I like to get oncology on board from the get-go is because I'm learning about prognosis. You know, that all goes into the decision-making process. The patient has to, you know, realize, you know, are they going to... You know, how long do they have to live? Are they going to spend that time recovering from a large surgery? All that gets taken into consideration, you know, whether they want to do it or not. A hundred percent. And as an orthopedic surgeon, you don't really have a good idea of prognosis. I mean, you can look up studies, but the oncologist, that's their bread and butter. They, that's what they do. So I think only they can really get a handle of that. So I, I agree a hundred percent. That's why I like to talk to the oncologist. When it's spread like that, do you tackle the spine surgically to decompress the area or you can go to the origin and the breast cancer? Yeah. In this case she did not have surgical treatment for a breast cancer. It was treated with chemo radiation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's another topic. That's another controversial topic of whether you should resect it to debulk right. the tumor. The, the origin. It's very controversial in stage four breast carcinoma. But any other comments? Okay, I, I have more to say. So so whether you do surgery or not, and what's the uh, prognosis, there are three, three scoring systems that I know. Takahashi score, Bear score, and Tamika, Tamita store, Tamika score, I forget. But they're all very similar, uh, and they give you an idea of prognosis. And uh, basically, I'll just read you the Takahashi score is general conditioning, number of extraspinal metastatic mets uh, in the body, uh, Mets to other organs, are they resectable, unresectable? The primary site of malignancy, uh, 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 the best malignancies to have longest longest the life prognosis is, is one of them is breast and prostate, which is the most common one. Whether they have a neurological deficit, so all these go into a score. And uh, this is just a, a article uh, from uh, 2016, Spine Surgery and Breast uh, Metastatic Breast Carcinoma Retrospect Analysis from Rome. It's 41 patients over uh, eight years. And the median survival was four years and two months, um, which uh, and they were treated with uh, surgery uh, and then radiation, chemotherapy, bisphosphonates. 
And um, four years is a long time. And um, basically, you want to walk. When you, if you have four years left, you want to walk during that time, see your grandchildren or whatever. Um, and the bisphosphonates are to inhibit osteoclast function, decrease bone pain, decrease hypercalcemia, and stop pathologic fra fractures. So the question is, when you have a case of epidural spinal cord compression, is it better to do surgery or is it better to do radiation? And I'm going to do this quickly. This is the landmark study from 2005, Lancet, Patchell study from University of Kentucky. And he randomized uh, patients uh, um, to radiation versus surgery plus radiation. Uh, and he, they excluded blood-borne tumors, lymphoma, lymphoma, leukemia, multiple myeloma, which are very radiosensitive. And they found that the surgical patients did way better. That uh, The surgical patients uh, walked or were able to walk 84% of the time versus 50. Uh, they, uh, they walked for a longer period of time. Uh, they regained the ability to walk uh, if they could not walk. Uh, they, they took a lot less pain pills. They, uh, their mortality was uh, way lower. Um, a lot of them crossed over to uh, surgery, but the patients who crossed over to surgery had radiation first then surgery did not do as well. So basically, uh, surgery works best if you have a, a, a spinal cord compression, uh, as long as it's not a blood-borne tumor and you have severe spinal cord compression. So uh, these spinal tumors, they're usually extradural 90% of the time. And 15% of the time, you have non-contiguous METs. So I have a, I usually, really yeah, go ahead. Good, good, out. good. Um, I've got wings and a cheesesteak. Wings and cheesesteak. No. No. <laughs> That's all right. The surgical goals are to decrease pain, uh, make the patient stable, decompress the logical structures. Almost everybody says chemotherapy, external beam radiation. Lymphomas, leukemias, multiple myelomas are very radiosensitive. Uh, melanomas are not sensitive at all. And uh, stereotactic radiation, uh, uh, these are all the different stereotactic radiation products out there in the, uh, in the um, community. And um, another score for instability is a spinal instability neoplastic score, the SIN score. And that takes into account where the fracture is, uh, how much pain they have, is it lethic, blastic, uh, to subluxation, how much of the bones collapsed. And you can get a score, and it, the score tells you you should do surgery or not. I think these are all helpful. I don't really use them that much, but I think about it. Um, and this, I don't know if you, uh, this is in the, um, the gnomes uh, technique that was described in 2013. That was in one of the articles I sent you guys. Uh, it takes four things into account, neurological status, oncological status, radi radio sensitive or not, mechanical status, we talked about the NIM score, and uh, the systemic status, whether they can have surgery. So um, these are, I think these are helpful, but uh, I don't use them 100% of the time, the scores and all. So any questions so far? Okay, so Brad, I want to ask you what you want to do here surgically. So this is this is the problem. So whenever I have a, a complex problem, I sit down and I write everything down so I have it in my mind what to do. You have three levels involved, T8, T9, T10. At T9, the tumor is circumferential. Uh, you have a 46-degree curve, which makes it a little difficult to put screws in. From T8 to T10, 21 degrees of uh, uh, kyphosis. The tumor is diffuse at T8 and T9. T6 looks normal. Uh, the ribs are involved on the right at T8, T9, T10, and she can't walk. So what would be your plan? So after, you know, lengthy discussion with the patient, they have to be aware of the fact that this surgery is not for, not curative. Okay. The whole goal of this surgery in my eyes is to get that spinal cord out of danger and hopefully restore what function that she already has. It might get better. Hopefully it stays the same. Hopefully it doesn't get worse. She needs uh, decompression of the spinal cord is the first objective. Can I, can I interrupt you one second? Of course. And there's one more there's one more term that people use called separation surgery, that it helps if you decompress the spinal cord completely, it separates the fecal sac spinal cord from the rest of the tumor. So the radio uh, oncologist can really radiate just where the cancer is. It makes it more difficult if, if there's not much room for the spinal cord. So you open up the spinal cord. And it's it's less likely to injure the spinal cord with the radiation if you separate everything. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Uh, so the goals of the surgery decompress the cord, and then you got to stabilize. Okay. So I would really need to scrutinize. I would do it all from the back. All right. I don't uh, Posterior. have a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon readily available at my institution to help with a transthoracic approach or something like that. Um, but it would involve multi level posterior decompression. I would try to remove that bone that we saw on the MRI that was involved, obviously. It looked like there was more tumoral involvement on the right side at the T9 level, so that would probably involve uh, removing that pedicle, doing a corpectomy in that area. I'd have to scrutinize the end plates of 8 and 10 and see if there's a landing spot for maybe some type of cage that I would put in from a costotransversectomy type approach. And then I would instrument, you know, two or three above and two or three below. Two levels, so four screws above at least, at four least, screws at below. Least, yeah. Okay. Depending on what my purchase was. So. Okay. All right. I mean, that's that's very close to what I did. So my, Ray, do you have any other comments? Okay, very close. I did laminectomies at every level where there's tumor. And my thought is uh, debulk the spinal cord as much as possible. I did um, five screws of five screws above, five screws below. I had difficulties with some of the screws because of tumor. Uh, I elected not to do a corpectomy because um, I thought uh, I thought that uh, it was not involved as much with the CAT scan, that just stabilizing it, uh, killing the cancer, everything should heal. And, and the only reason I don't do it is there's more time involved. Um, so the surgery took uh, five hours. She lost um, 800 cc's of blood, and um, she got one unit in the uh, uh, OR. So here's her post-op. You can see the screws. And um, the insertion of the screws were extremely difficult because she was a small woman in scoliosis, and you could barely see the x-ray on the C-arm. And um, Guided with uh, Spiro's eyes and brain. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, it's a different robot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a robot. But, uh, he's all right. And then you can see the laminectomy and the instrumentation. And um, and you can see the window. The pedicles were very small. You don't have much room to insert this screw. Uh, and if you're too far lateral, you're into the aortic arch. If you're too far medial, you're into the spinal canal. So it has to be just right. And the threads were medial. And uh, I got a CAT scan because I was concerned about that. I thought it was as good as it could be in, in the OR. Uh, patient had absolutely no symptoms. So, uh, yeah. And the path was, uh, you can see here the pathology, the little circular areas. Those are the breast cancer ducts trying to form a duct, basically. And you can see the bone on the top left. And... The, you see the middle portion, those are the cancer cells. They're dark, they're irregular, and surrounding all of it is the fibrous tissue. And here's the cancer close up, the cancer cell. It's trying to form a duct, but it's not really a duct. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the pycnotic, very dark nuclei, and they're irregular. And uh, the, the pathology, you know, they do the pathology in the hospital. They do all the stains. And she turned out to be... Um, positive for everything and estrogen register estrogen receptor positive which is associated with a good prognosis so katie you remember her right what's this that was, first this was the first that's the first don't say where this first case okay. tell her how she did <laughs> tell her how tell everyone how she did well. yeah no yeah. and i'm not and i'm not i'm telling you the truth the first day after surgery she said i feel better mm -hmm. so the fact that the, the, de the spinal cord was decompressed and the spine was instrumented. So basically every time she stood up, her spine was rocking through that fracture. You impressed the PA that changed out. Yeah, the next day. <laughs> and you know what? I knew she was going to do better because, because when the spine stabilized and the spinal cord was decompressed and she didn't even need pain medicine. And I saw her three months later. She's so, so happy. And um, it's stressful as a doctor because I was about to start the case and the nurse anesthetist said to me, why are you even doing surgery in this case? Are you serious? Are you serious? <laughs> Do you know what you're talking about? Like, and she was like, giving me a real hard time about the case. And, uh, you know, it's hard as a surgeon. You're stressful. You want to do what's right. And there's people second guessing you. Um, but, uh, you know, she did fantastic. Uh, maybe it was luck. Uh, but I think it was because she had a serious problem and you basically fixed the problem for her. And uh, I saw her back three months. She's super, super happy. She went through radiation, chemo. She feels great. Uh, no, no pain.
So that's the, uh, not every case does perfect, but this case did. So, so any questions about, um, that's it I have today. Yeah. My only question is, can you see this in patients that are not stage four? What, Met, METs? Well, if you have, if you have breast cancer, oh, so all the, the cancers are different, but in breast cancer, yeah, if breast cancer, if it leaves the breast, it uh, goes to another part of the body, it's stage four. Right, so you can't see exactly Well, by definition, by definition, it's, it's not stage four. So breast cancer mostly stays in the breast. Right. And then, but when it, when it travels, usually goes to the spine, yeah, no, automatically stage four. Really very briefly about my mom's situation. They don't talk about your mom now. We'll do that offline. We'll do that offline. We'll do that offline. But we'll talk about it in one second. So what are any other questions about breast cancer or spine? Everybody good? All right. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for coming to Spine. You're welcome. Thanks for coming to the Spine Conference.